Hello YouTube and welcome again to my channel. This time I think I'm going to discuss stories of what it was like to be an elder. So I'll start from the beginning. As I've said in previous videos, I served for almost 10 years as an elder. And I remember I had that goal for a while. And in the particular congregation that I was in, the body of elders was a little bit interesting, as I perceive that most are. But individuals that I had known that were elders that had worked with the elders in my congregation told me some of the things that were going on and that they had dealt with. Anyways, when I got appointed, the then presiding overseer kind of filled me in on what was going on on the body of elders. There was at least one individual who was oftentimes troublesome um, and who liked getting his way and didn't seem to care much for doing things the right way or the way we were supposed to or any of that. And there was another individual that was very strong-willed and, and very similar to the first individual. So at the time, those were two out of many. So the body functioned. But anyways, it was something that was interesting. And it's kind of interesting when you become appointed as an elder to be let inside on the politics of what it's like to be an elder. Now, for people who assume that elders are all very spiritual, that might be shocking to find out that there are politics on bodies of elders, and sometimes even between bodies of elders. And there are politics between elders on circuit assemblies and at district conventions and pretty much almost every function that involves elders. So that was one of the more interesting things for me to learn, because when I was appointed, my thought was that everyone was just going to be working together to do things Jehovah's way and to make sure that they were upbuilding the congregation. Well, that was really naive of me, because that's not the way that it worked. There were elders whose main concern was just having things done their way, um, regardless of whether or not they had scriptural points or even direction from the faithful and discreet slave on how to do things. In fact, at one time, one elder tried to use the argument that the local congregation was actually the flock of sheep that belonged to the elders, which really took me by surprise. So this is the body of elders, or one of the bodies of elders that I served on, and they're the one that I'm going to tell stories about because they are by far um, the most interesting. So anyways, when I was on that body, I served on a couple of judicial committees. It's a process that has to be done because it's mandated by the governing body, by the faithful and discreet slave. And in the literature, they act as if the judicial process is a loving process. The idea is advocated that the point of the process is to help people who are doing things wrong that will damage their relationship with Jehovah. But the actual execution of the judicial process is not quite work that way. A lot of things factor into that. Um, for example, in the literature it tells you that if you're truly repentant that you won't be disfellowshipped. But that is not always true. The elders have their own special book. It was updated in 2010 and there's instruction, in fact more than half of it, is devoted to dealing with the judicial process. When you have a committee, um, how to have the committee, um, what to look for and as far as repentance is concerned, what restrictions to impose, uh, how people should interact, and, and all that type of stuff. And it's there's a lot of rules involved, and judicial committees are extremely rules-based. Um, you're theoretically looking for repentance, but it's a very regimented set of things that you're looking for that actually define repentance. So in some cases, there is actually a chapter um, or a paragraph, rather, in one of those chapters. I think it's in chapter 6. But it spells out that there are times when an individual may have gone so far into a course of sin, or perhaps they were dealt with repeatedly by judicial committees, and after a certain point you can no longer believe their plea of repentance. So there are literally times when the judicial committee will not be able to accept a plea of repentance, no matter how repentant that individual appears. So the way different elders apply that is going to vary a lot from body to body. 
and even sometimes depending on the brothers that are assigned to judicial case. So myself, I sat on less than 10 judicial committees. We thankfully did not have a lot of judicial action going on where I was. But in two of those cases, that rule came into play. And we disfellowship people specifically because of that rule. Because we didn't think we could accept their plea of repentance. In retrospect, both those individuals were truly repentant, but our hands were tied, or so we felt. And anyways, the judicial process was something I always hated doing as an elder. I never liked knowing the wrong things people were doing. Uh, at the time, I believed I was helping them, um, but I always hated the process. I hated being on judicial committees. I hated having to work with people in that way. It was always, I really hated it. Uh, what's even worse than that, I'll, I'll tell you, one of the worst things that you have to do as an elder, at least in my opinion, was to get up and to announce that someone is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I always, always, always hated that. I never had a, never liked doing that. And i no longer an elder, so I no longer have to. But that's the uh, judicial process. Uh, but a lot of people, the judicial process is set up so that people are guilty until they are proven innocent. If you get to the point where you are having a judicial committee, the reason they're having the committee is because they feel that you're guilty of serious sin. If they don't think there's enough to prove guilt, they will not have a judicial committee. What they'll do is they'll send two brothers usually to investigate, and they'll sit down and talk and try to establish whether there's a reason for a committee or not. So once it's established that there's enough reason to have a committee, at that point you are pretty much guilty. And the point of the committee is to see if you can be brought to repentance. And you know, so you can be repentant, but if you have crossed some magical and physical line that's defined by the governing body and that's interpreted differently from body to body, well, if you've crossed that line, you're going to be disfellowshipped no matter what. Uh, if you haven't crossed that line and you can prove you're repentant, then you're only going to get reproved. And it might be public or it might be private, depending on how well known the event is or how well known it likely will be. So once again, the application of those things vary greatly. So judicial committees are only established when they feel that people are guilty. And of course, you can, you don't really, well, if you have witnesses that can defend you, you can call them. Uh, myself, I haven't been on many cases, so I really don't know how that works. But there are times when uh, they think there's enough for a case, but you can still prove your innocence. But I never was involved in any cases like that. But like I said, I wasn't involved in many cases. And it wasn't fun. But when it gets into matters of fornication or adultery, there are very specific things the elders are trained to look for to see how deep into the practice of sin an individual has gone. So that's why the elders oftentimes ask uncomfortable questions. And some elders perhaps get a little bit overly zealous about that. Uh, myself, I never enjoyed that process at all. Um, I never liked being in the process of having to ask those embarrassing questions or having to receive the embarrassing answers. And I felt like it wasn't really necessary to know the person's heart condition. But I did my job as much as I hated it. And thankfully, it wasn't often I had to worry about that. Uh, so we would get enough information to determine what we needed to, and we would leave it at that. I don't think there was anybody on our body that um, would regularly go too far in that questioning, but I didn't sit on many of those many cases, so I really don't know. But it just was never a fun thing to do. <clears throat> so as an elder, though, uh, another thing that you're involved with is when the circuit overseer comes, he always has a meeting with the elders, and himself to discuss how the congregation is doing. And the you have when you're an elder, you have to get together all the congregational records for the circuit overseer to examine every single time he comes around. Included in those records are the publisher record cards and the congregation meeting attendance records and that sort of thing. So basically he wants to see how the publisher are doing. And if the congregation is small enough, he'll look at every single card. And he compiles a report on how the publishers are doing, how many of them are active, meaning how many of them go in service every month, what's the average number of hours for a publisher, um, how many are, are inactive or irregular, 
irregular means they've missed a month in service. Uh, sometimes if you, you can go in service and not report your service and you'll be considered irregular until you report that month of service. So typically when the circuit overseer came, there was a huge effort to go and collect all the missing field service reports. And it was a really big effort. And the circuit overseer would let you know he was disappointed and the elders were not doing their jobs if the number of irregular people kept going on. You know, he was not happy about that. It was his job to make sure that the elders were out there convincing everyone to be active in the ministry. And then if they were all active, well then you want to convince them to be out in service more. So he pretty much, there were times when he could be satisfied, but his instruction was to find something to commend the body on and find something they could improve on. So there would always be something to improve on. You could always encourage someone else to go in service more, to get to more meetings, and what have you. And that was basically how people's spirituality was judged, based on the numbers they wrote down on their reports. And I remember one time I was a secretary and the particular circuit overseer had noted that some of the numbers on the publisher record cards looked very similar to each other. And I don't know why that is. I just recorded the numbers that people wrote down on their on their cards. So he asked me about that. I'm like, yeah, I, I guess they are. I don't know what he wanted me to do about it. Maybe he sent some type of conspiracy or something. I really, I couldn't tell. But every single aspect of service as rendered by Jehovah's Witnesses in line with what the organization dictates is subject to judgment and review of the elders and the circuit overseer. And they will impute your spirituality based upon those numbers. Uh, there's no statistic to measure how much of a Christ-like personality you've put on. There's nowhere where you can measure the number of good deeds you've done taking care of orphans and widows, as James describes. Uh, there's no word you can record how many times you've helped out a fellow brother or sister or a stranger in need. There's nothing along those lines that's reported in any way, shape, or form to the branch. The circuit overseer may make a comment like there's a good spirit in this hall, they're uh, very hospitable, or that type of thing. But the only numbers or indication of any type of spirituality that the branch ever saw were the numbers for preaching and the numbers for meeting attendance. And that was really and truthfully all they ever cared about. So you could have an individual that was a pioneer getting all kinds of placements and things, but that individual might be a complete and total jerk. And uh, typically speaking, that would be fine. You know, they'd be viewed as a spiritual person because they're producing, they have numbers. And there were cases where I ran across people like that. They were good pioneers, they had the numbers, but their personality was anything but Christ-like as described in the Bible. So there's, there's very little actual effort made on the part of either the organization uh, or those uh, the elders or the circuit overseers or what have you to advocate people actually being Christian. Now they'll give a lip service in their talks and there'll be articles about it in the magazines, but typically speaking, unless you're really off the wall and you're causing divisions in the congregation, that's the only point at which anybody will ever bother you about it. So if you're just uh, eccentric or if you're uh, just not very Christian, if it's not causing divisions, you can pretty much get away with it. Someone might say something to you every now and then, but the way to get elders to shep and to be concerned about you is by not going out in service. That will get their notice really fast. They'll be all over you if you do that, or if you start missing meetings. Those are the things that they view as important. So that's kind of an overview of what it was like to be an elder. There is a lot more to describe, so maybe I'll do another video. But even that probably won't encompass all of my experiences. I'm just trying to give you an idea of what it was like and what I had done and so forth. So thanks for listening, YouTube. Talk to you later.